This video will be part of a series on the Ford Assist, Kyle Rittenhouse's use of it, and some more broadly related things. Before watching this video, you should first watch the video of Kyle Rittenhouse's act of self-defense, if you have not already, which is in the description below. You should also consider watching my earlier video listed in the description, which more simply in scope covered the popular bad arguments against the Ford Assist. Citations and references throughout this video can also be found in the description. The claims against Kyle needing the Ford Assist can be summarized as such. Kyle Rittenhouse did not need to use the Ford Assist, and some other method was equivalent or better. These claims also have some qualifications added to them, such as his rifle is bad, the ammunition was not good, or that the rifle is not maintained properly. We'll get to each of those. For now though, we'll just focus on the question of necessity regarding the Ford Assist in Kyle's circumstance as it applies to the AR-15 in general. I will also give specific examples of these bad arguments as they are being discussed. But before we move on to those arguments, let's establish a starting point for our discussion. In this video, I will go over the facts behind Kyle's rifle as well as immediate action and its relation to clearing common stoppages in AR-15s in general. Starting with the basic facts of Kyle's rifle, Kyle or his friend had purchased an MMP-15 Sport II brand new in May of 2020 and famously used the forward assist in self-defense not even three full months later in August of that same year. In between that time, he had shot not more than 150 or 120 rounds as established in the trial by the prosecution. He also shot eight times during his acts of self-defense. MMP-15 Sport IIs, which I shall henceforth refer to as MMP rifles, come with a generous amount of oil from the factory. Just watch any of the unboxing videos on YouTube to see for yourself. It's greasy. I'm assuming they grease this thing up like this. M&P rifles also come from the factory with a carbine weight buffer, a Carpenter 158 steel bolt, a marginally lighter chrome line semi-auto carrier by 3 tenths of an ounce, a four coil extractor spring with o-ring to add tension during extraction, a nitrided bore and chamber, and an M4 carbine mil spec gas port of 62 thousandths of an inch using a carbine length gas system on a 16 inch barrel length giving a marginally different dwell time than mil spec but otherwise highly similar to a military M4. He was also using Aguila 223 brass cased ammunition fed from a Magpul PMAG, which is the magazine that the rifle comes with from the factory and the one Kyle used that day. Aguila ammunition has somewhat slightly milder loads than comparable mil spec rounds according to the manufacturer's advertised velocity data, and one would expect it to produce slightly less gas port pressure than a mil spec velocity load. Kyle also stated his rifle was about one inch out of battery and also visually demonstrated the distance with his finger. That my ejection port is opened about an inch and... This means the round attempting to feed was stripped out of the magazine and the forwardmost section of the round was already entering the chamber. There are multiple concerns about the correct course of action when the rifle is one inch out of battery that I will cover later. He then used a forward assist to successfully chamber around and fired it. The fact that he did not or is not able to use correct terminology in his televised interview does not change the material facts of what actually happened with his rifle and what Kyle actually did to it. Consider also that during the time in which Kyle used the forward assist, he was sitting down and bladed in such a way that the charging handle may have been harder for him to actuate then press the forward assist. I will go over why Kyle's rifle as a budget gun with semi-auto carrier has no way of knowingly presenting an issue with feeding and that questioning the quality of his gun in relation to this jam is not a good idea in a following video. First, we will examine why the forward assist was the fastest and only action immediately available to Kyle to rectify his rifle. To do this, I will use 3D models and cutaways from a game called World of Guns that illustrates with great detail the operations of firearms. 
The 3D models will give a much clearer picture than is possible with a standard physical AR-15. I will also induce stoppages on an actual AR-15 at various points of the rifle's feeding to demonstrate the resultant further stoppages from clearing a failure to feed by using the charging handle. And before that, I'll explain immediate action versus remedial action and their relation to each other so that we're all on the same page. I will also consider the scope of immediate action drills against the forward assist for most all stoppages encountered. This is necessary because many people confuse the purpose of immediate action and what it is actually intended to address. An immediate action is done when a weapon stops firing without inquiry into why. In 1966, it was defined quite well by the Army in FM 23-9 as the unhesitating application of a probable remedy to reduce a stoppage without investigating the cause. This means that you are performing some specific remedy that has a high chance of solving the issue without specifically knowing what is wrong with the rifle. The reason why someone would perform a specific remedy without knowing the stoppage would be that in some prior analysis, the frequency of stoppages from testing would be known and that the user would be able to generally apply a predefined immediate action drill. This drill would be able to address the most frequent or the most common stoppages so that they could blindly fix most stoppages using a singular rigid procedure of immediate action with the rationale that a blind immediate application out of likelihood is faster than trying to figure out what the given unknown problem is. Some popular examples today of immediate action drills are the tap rack bang procedure or the army sports procedure. A remedial action would be some kind of further action beyond immediate action and or investigation into why it stopped and analyzing the situation for a correct way to get around into battery and fire. Both have a risk and reward in the context of a martial situation. Immediate action has the benefit of being possibly faster and keeping situational awareness when correctly applied, but also risks inducing some further problems, such as a double feed as an example when some malfunctions are not known and present. I will demonstrate this point later. Remedial action, on the other hand, has the benefit of being a sure way to clear an unknown malfunction at the cost of the fastest times allowed for by immediate action. Obviously, these risks do not apply in the same way to civil activities of the AR-15, such as plinking or competition shooting, since there isn't the same risk of one's own life, so there is no need to apply this criteria to an irrelevant situation. Before we continue, it is necessary to make a special note about the specifics of sports as a procedure in the interest of definitions and starting points. In some documents and instruction, it is taught the O in the mnemonic abbreviation is merely to observe ejection, while in other documents and with other instructors, it is taught to also observe in the chamber for obstruction. To some extent, sports can also be considered a remedial action depending upon the application of observation in the sense that there is some investigation done with the observation step and implied further remediation. Otherwise, what would have been the point of observing the chamber? Here's the 1966 XM16E1 field manual, FM23-9, to show the initial immediate action drill that preceded sports in omitted observation of anything. This was then superseded by an early version of sports in 1968 that included two uses of the forward assist where the forward assist was tapped first to ensure extractor engagement then the rest of sports happen, with the O here representing observation of ejection only. So in a sense, it was T-sports. Later, of course, that first tap of the forward assist was dropped at the latest by 1974, when the manuals happen to now reflect the type classification of the M16A1, which gives us the familiar procedure of sports, though it wasn't yet in the mnemonic acronym form we use now. In 1977, the M16TM did include the sports mnemonic acronym. It also noted that you should eyeball the chamber for the observation step. Since then, there was, and still is, an inconsistent direction from different manuals and sources over the decades on whether the chamber should be observed or not. 
And now at least, the procedure involves checking that the selector is on auto or fire according to the Army's PS magazine, which shows the O as only observing ejection and not the chamber. It also states that the sports acronym is properly C Sports now. I have visited the Army Pub's website on a Nipper computer, but it was down for maintenance, so I was unable to confirm what the latest M4 technical manual says, but the latest one I have is from 1998, and it says to check the chamber. As a note, regarding the importance on the scope of observation is that the first step of investigation and identifying the malfunction is also the first step in a remedial action and the line of immediate and remedial action becomes ill-defined in broader applications of sports in the degree of observation done. This is because looking at the chamber in sports has the same action of the first step of remedial action where you are attempting to diagnose the type of stoppage. Going back to the original definition, is an action performed quickly and immediately based on the fact that it has a high degree of probability in fixing the issue quickly without attempting to identify the cause. If you're going to try to observe what the stoppage actually is, or if it's a certain kind, then it doesn't make much sense to have a rigidly defined singular procedure if you're able to observe a jam and with sufficient knowledge know the fastest action to clear the stoppage after looking at the chamber. Much of this focus on the observation part and its possible slowness is why many people have advocated for potentially faster alternative immediate action procedures such as tap rack bang which omit such a step. I am not the only person who says this. As far back as 2004, Sergeant First Class James B. Couch of the U.S. Army also reiterated these points on sports in the U.S. Army Infantry Magazine publication about sports not being an immediate action in Army manuals having inconsistent direction about observation. This is also around the time that tap rack bang seems to have come into existence. It seems that it is a technique that emerged out of the beginnings of the global war on terror, though if any of you know more specific or older origins, please go ahead and post them in the comments. Specifically, tap rack bang was being framed as a faster immediate action compared to sports. Interestingly, as a side note, Couch does not have a favorable opinion of the forward assist and also simultaneously seems to respect Clint Smith's opinions on the subject, which may also explain part or most of Couch's opinion on the forward assist. I'll speak more about Clint Smith in a later video, and perhaps later in this one, but it should suffice here to note that Clint Smith has been an instructor for a long time and has had experience with the AR-15 starting from quite some time ago, so it is not unreasonable for what Couch has said so far. For the purposes of our discussion, I am not interested in the ultimate specifics of remedial action per se, since with proper logic, understanding, and observation, a person should be able to come to a correct conclusion, and hopefully the best one, on their own on the course of action that should be executed. If someone applies a noble, inappropriate remedial action, then the fault would be on the person since there is no specific procedure to blame here. It is in this regard that I am interested that the forward assist should be included, at the very least, as an option in deliberations of remedial action, as many people have excluded its use altogether. I am also interested in comparing its use as a hypothetical immediate action against other immediate action drills in all the variations of failure to feed malfunctions unrelated to parts breakage. I am doing this in order to see the relative appropriateness of using popular immediate action drills that are said by some to be more appropriate than the use of the forward assist. They will also act as a baseline of comparison for the forward assist being called a bad idea since if we use good or bad, there must be a comparison to something. With that said, let's consider all the possible feeding malfunctions and a comparison of the forward assist with other remediation techniques in detail. Our first consideration of a failure to feed is a simple minor obstruction or frictional element such as what Kyle experienced with his rifle or the mud in the TCOM test where the bolt would be clearly observed to be out of battery, the round being pushed or attempting to be pushed out of the magazine. 
I am considering this distinct from magazine-related failures, which I will cover later. As I demonstrated in my previous video, the forward assist is able to strip around from the magazine at any point of the rifle cycling movement so that the forward assist can be appropriately used to clear such a malfunction. Also shown in my last video, the TCOM test demonstrated that the forward assist was capable of chambering every round that failed to feed in such a circumstance. So there is at least a high degree of reliability in this. Also demonstrated in the test was that there is no positive correlation between forcing the bolt close and failures to extract when compared against the control of a round chambering on its own in the same conditions. This is even the case when considering the assumption of the worst case against the Ford Assist in using the test data. So to say otherwise is not empirically warranted. What I didn't cover in my last video was that in those test cases of failures to extract, the TCOM test demonstrated that half of the failures to extract could be fixed by use of the old, inferior, sm and smaller charging handle. And the other half could be fixed by mortaring the rifle. I'll cover more on that charging handle change in a later video. To some degree, the rifle's gas system is blowing gas around the gas key and the carrier vent holes, so there is some element of the historically hyperbolic self-cleaning rifle effect going on here. The rifle's gas system's residual pressure after firing and beginning part of cycling might actually be a contributing factor to the forward assist having a slightly lower failure to extract expectancy than the round chambering solely from the rifle's own cycling and failing to extract as well. Enough of that speculation though. Depending upon how much the round was stripped from the magazine, using the charging handle to re-rack the rifle using other immediate action drills can induce a double feed. This is because the extractor isn't able to extract a round in the process of being fed, only one that has been seated in the chamber. This fact is because the AR-15 is a push feed rifle that does not have the extractor slip over the rim of a case until the rifle is in the process of chambering and locking in battery. You can see the extractor slip over the rim here in this 3D model demonstration. All right, so we're here in World of Guns. I've got the M16 here, and uh, we're gonna be going through the cutaway of the rifle so we can get a better idea of exactly when the extractor engages the rim uh, because it seems like very many of uh, people are confused as to when you can retract the bolt and expect it to have positive control over the rim of the cartridge. So um, we're going to do the uh, cutaway feature here. I'm going to do click and hide, this sort of stuff. And uh, this will give us a better kind of uh, insight as to when exactly extractor grabs uh, the rim of the case because it is modeled very well in in this program. So uh, right here we've got the whole cycle of operations. Uh, you know, so it's basically just one round being fired and so I can control exactly what's going on here. So uh, we're focused on the feeding part so we're just going to go from right here forward. So right here obviously the rounds being fed uh, it does not have positive control over the rim, that is the extractor does not have positive control of the rim. So uh, we're going to go forward, uh, it's out of the magazine, and uh, right here, uh, still we don't have positive control of the rim, the extractor is nowhere near it, and uh, if you were to retract the uh, bolt here, you would be going and uh, feeding a new round, because the bolt would pick up this round if it were to retract rearward. So um, it, would, it would come up, because right now the bolt's kind of holding it down. Anyways, uh, going beyond that, we've got the round going uh, into the chamber. It's starting to go in there. Um, and still yet, we do not have positive control over the rim at this point. So I'm going to click the uh, the cutaway feature so you can kind of see. Look, this is about an inch out of battery right here. And we still do not have control over it. So like from, for instance... Uh, Kyle Rittenhouse's view, we still do not have control of the rim right here. So going back to the uh, cutaway, we're going to move forward and going right here, we're going to look at the cutaway again. So this could be seen that two 
um, from the perspective of Kyle describing uh, one inch out of battery. Here we still do not have positive control over the rim because the extractor is not slipped over. It's behind it. It's pushing on the case, but if you were to retract the bolt right now, there's nothing grabbing the rim, so the, the cartridge would still be there and you would cause a double feed if you were to retract it far enough and let go of it to feed a new round. So um, exactly when it does grab the rim uh, is just slightly ahead. Uh, it's pushing it into into batter. It's beginning to push it all the way into the chamber, and we still do not have positive control of the rim. Uh, and just to show you, this is what this looks like right here at this point of the ejection port. So moving forward, we've got... Oh, look at that. You see it? It's starting to slip over right here. Just starting to slip over right here in the program. So this one, the program might be doing it a little bit early, but uh, if you can see, it's basically doing that right as the bolt is going into battery, but not fully locked yet, which is appropriate because look how much distance the round has to travel. So it's starting to go over, and it does not fully go over until you can see it's actually being depressed right here. So it's starting to be depressed, and then it's going back up, and that's fully when it's in battery, it's fully engaged over the rim. So it's modeled pretty correctly in that the bolt has to be all the way forward and into battery for it to snap over the case, because what's happening is the bolt is uh, moving forward, but the round is not able to anymore. So that's exactly when the rim is going to, excuse me, the extractor is going to slip over the rim. And uh, specifically, let's show you right about here. We can say that the, the round is fully under control of the rim right about here. Uh, that's pretty much right in battery. And this is what it looks like. So um, maybe a little early right here. So going forward. We'll look at the earliest point in which the bolt is fully in battery, so right about there. And look at that. That's exactly where you would expect to be able to, at the earliest, retract the, the bolt using the charging handle and expect to have positive control over the cartridge that you have fed. So really, not until this point are you able to... Uh, extract around using the charging handle and not cause a double feed. So now that we've seen the 3D models, let's take a look at some induced failure to feed jams at various points of the feeding stage to see if the theory holds up in the real world. Here we have a failure to feed that is clearly visible before the point of the 3D model of the extractor's engagement and approximately one inch out of battery, like Kyle Rittenhouse's rifle. So we should expect to see a failure to retract the first round fed and a resultant double feed, which is exactly what we do see here. Another example shows the earliest point at which the extractor engages the rim of the cartridge being fed. And here we see that it does indeed line up with the 3D model we saw earlier, and that the bulk carrier appears short by only a fraction of an inch, and not close to the one inch out of battery like Kyle attested to. This would be the earliest point after a round has left the magazine in which you could expect to not cause a double feed when using the charging handle to clear a feeding stoppage. A third example shows a stoppage at the earliest point in which a round leaves the magazine and where the use of the charging handle can induce a double feed. As you can see, the rim of the cartridge has moved beyond the feed lips. Before this point, using the charging handle will not cause a double feed, but here and beyond, a double feed will occur if the charging handle is used. This point appears at the minimum one inch out of battery or more, so it is likely Kyle's rifle was at a minimum this point or further forward along the feeding process. As I have demonstrated in my previous video, the forward assist is able to move the bolt forward at any point in the rifle's cycling movement 
and does not suffer from the same flaw of not controlling the rim of the cartridge. So it is entirely unaffected by the feeding stoppage's location. It is then reasonable to conclude that Kyle was better served by the forward assist than of the certainty of inducing a double feed through manipulation of the charging handle through sports or tap rack or any other immediate action. While we're at this point, I will continue the analysis of the forward assist in relation to other types of feeding stoppages as to give a better picture of why people mistakenly abdicate for it even in retrospectively bad situations like Kyle's. A second consideration is when a loose primer or other unobservable obstruction will prevent a round being chambered regardless of the amount of force applied to the carrier. While this is true on its own, you would also not be able to immediately observe or know of such an obstruction without going into a deeper remedial action, thus precluding all of the immediate action drills from being useful in this situation. Such an obstruction is also not able to be cleared by any of the alternative immediate action drills. Since it is not immediately observable and no specific timely action appears more applicable than another, after a simple process of observation, it seems like whatever is done to the rifle as a guess to fix the problem isn't any worse than another. I say this because in some cases where the fortices can often clear something like a broken buffer retaining pin keeping the bolt carrier group wedged to the rear, while on the other hand, some tiny pebble in the bolt carrier group's cam slot might be able to keep the rifle from being able to chamber no matter how hard the forward assist is pressed. I cannot speak to the likelihood of all situations of loose debris affecting the AR-15, so I cannot say whether it is good or bad overall in reference to reliability test data, only that there are different occasions where the forward assist use is good or bad, and that an educated person should know this. A third consideration is a stuck case, where here, Immediate action drills would end up doing a double feed if it didn't occur already, while the forward assist would either do nothing to an existing double feed from the carrier's own cycling after letting go of the stuck case, or it would attempt to grab the rim of the stuck case a second time in the case of a short stroke, which is the preferable of the two scenarios presented here. In the latter case, the rim may be deformed and it may be harder for the extractor to slip over a rim, and the use of the forward assist might be necessary and could help extract a case that has already contracted after being relieved of chamber pressure, which may have been the originating cause of the stuck case. On highly overgassed rifles, there is such an extreme occurrence of early unlocking before the case has reduced chamber pressure that sometimes simply locking the bolt to the rear on a stuck case and pointing the gun upwards is enough to let the case fall out of the chamber on its own from gravity. This is from the bolt trying to extract a round while the case is experiencing a high chamber pressure and temporarily sticking to a degree against the chamber walls. Though of course with a stuck case a cleaning rod is the sure solution but its use is not an immediate action and the forward assist does not make this problem any worse than any other immediate action drill and in a specific situation of a stuck case it could resolve it better than any of the other immediate actions. Also, in cases where the extractor slips off the rim of a stuck case, it is possible that the rifle double feeds. This is more typical on highly overgassed rifles. A fourth consideration is bolt override, where brass is sitting above the bolt in the upper receiver. This is better shown in this example here. This malfunction requires remedial action and the use of the forward assist will fail similarly to any other immediate action. While the forward assist is indeed mauling the brass in such a circumstance, those rounds are typically being ejected in the clearing procedure and those same rounds are also being damaged by the proper clearing procedures itself. I've linked a video that discusses the methods for clearing such a malfunction in the description below. A fifth consideration is a stovepipe. This is probably the easiest and fastest identifiable stoppage where a person would obviously avoid the initial use of the forward assist. Stovepipes are essentially a failure to eject along with a resultant double feed when there is an additional round in the magazine being fed from the bolt's forward motion. 
Just like a double feed, one must also be careful when using the charging handle to clear the rifle as to avoid inducing what is essentially a triple feed like in our first consideration of a basic failure to feed as the same principles apply here where the extractor has not engaged the rim of the case being chambered and simply racking the rifle fully will only add another round attempting to feed. And being careful not to retract the bolt too far rearward but just enough for the stovepipe to fall out the forward assist could be useful if the bolt is not able to go fully into battery and be locked because of the necessary shorter distance it is retracted. Otherwise, a person could clear the malfunction in the same lengthier way a double feed would be cleared where the magazine is dropped, the bolt locked back, and so on. A well-made video by Ed Spinoza covers this malfunction, its considerations, along with his unique recommendation on clearing the malfunction which you can find in the description below. A sixth consideration is a broken shell or case head separation. This is where the rear of the case splits away from the front during an extraction in the chamber. More often, the front of the case is still left in the chamber, though sometimes both parts come out. Amazingly, this one was caught on high-speed video. This video shows a slightly rarer broken shell stoppage where the forward part of the case is actually extracted from the chamber and can be considered similarly to a double feed. More often though, when the forward part of the case is still in the chamber, typically a broken shell extractor is required and the stoppage is not clearable by any immediate action drill. In the situation of the forward part of the case being stuck in the chamber and a broken shell extractor tool is not available because of the time or whatever reason, the forward assist can be used. It is used by attempting to chamber another round and creating an interference fit to help pull the old broken casing out as demonstrated in the thread on AR15.com. Since the broken shell malfunction more often leaves the broken case in the chamber, it seems that the Ford Assist does more overall good for fixing broken shell stoppages than any immediate action drill, and immediate action drills also do not seem to be any better when the forward part of the case more rarely is extracted but causes a double feed. A seventh consideration is some magazine related problem where the follower or rounds are binding during feeding or the magazine itself is not fully and properly seated and locked into place. This consideration here is what our extant immediate action drills such as tap rack, push pull rack, sports, and so on seem to actually be intended to address since they do not seem to actually address the other possible scenarios of the rifle's feeding and chambering cycle being stopped. To understand the emphasis of immediate action on magazine malfunctions, I will briefly explain the history of AR-15 magazines. This will help shed some light on the emphasis of our extant immediate action drills being tailored specifically for magazine-related issues to the detriment of feeding and or extraction. Historically, with 30-round USGI magazines, the original black and green followers had notorious follower tilt issues, and it wasn't until at least 2011 or 2012 when the Army was even able to distribute tan followers to all soldiers in combat theaters, along with the beginning of M855A1 issuance, which I personally witnessed. The tan followers and all the commercially available anti-tilt design magazine followers I have experience with seem wholly adequate at removing follower tilt as a factor for stoppages. Pictured here is the original black color design follower that carried some features from the straight 20 round magazine design. Straight magazines that have tapered cartridges necessarily have the followers tilt to a degree to account for the taper of the case adding up successively for each round. Because of that, the black followers had no frontal anti-tilt feature as to allow the follower to tilt with the front upward slightly for being fully loaded in a straight 20 round magazine. The original 30 round USGI magazine body, still used today, actually has two straight portions. The upward part of the magazine is straight for the straight magazine well and the bottom end is also straight. Only the middle is curved. Robert Fremont, who was one of the original AR-15 designers along with James Sullivan, is credited as the designer of the original 30 round magazine. The patent attests that the follower was intentionally designed to tilt, stating, the tiltability of the follower is for fan buildup of tapered cartridges in the straight side portions. 
The patent also attests to the specific curvature using the technical term intermediate arcuate portions. As you can see with the black follower, there is a minor anti-tilt feature at its rear. Sonar talks about this more generally with how you can get away with straight magazines for a limited number of rounds before the magazine needs to curve or be entirely curved. Unfortunately, he doesn't talk in depth about it, but it appears he is implying or alluding to the fact that there is a minor amount of tilting that is allowed for in a follower as to uh, accommodate the taper of the cartridges in a straight walled magazine. Well, actually, in a short magazine, you can get by with a straight magazine, but as soon as you get any larger capacity, it must be curved to accommodate, you know, the natural curve of the ammunition. <laughs> but this this must be curved in order to have a good magazine with you know most any almost any cartridge as soon as you get the capacity or the number of rounds up then you have to do that it works fine with short magazines but not anything long the green follower pictured here was an update to Fremont's design of the black follower which added significant front anti tilt tabs to the follower I guess either Fremont overestimated the need for follower tilt, or maybe more appropriately, that there's just enough clearance in this new design to allow the follower to minimally tilt just enough throughout its feed cycle. Next, the tan follower seems to address the disparity of the anti-tilt tabs and made the rear tab comparable to the green's front tab, as it seems the green was good at reducing the front of the follower from tilting upwards, but not the rear. It also appears to be a copy of the Magpul aftermarket follower upgrade as the Magpul of follower was available for sale before the TAN follower's existence. The TAN follower, however, interfaces to the spring differently and consequently needs a different spring, which precludes the use or upgrade of old USGI magazines and their springs with the new followers. Unlike the Magpul, which properly interfaces with the older USGI magazine spring design, the follow-on USGI blue followers seem to have kept this same anti-tilt design of the tan one along with the new spring and interface. Moving on from followers, swollen and out-of-spec magazines such as old USGI aluminum magazines sometimes require some amount of additional force compared to normal to be inserted. Magpools and other polymer magazines, for instance, can present a specific problem of positioning the second round too high to allow the magazine catch to engage requiring double the force to insert a magazine, or even more, sometimes, on some rifles. Magpul calls this a transposition of the rounds. Feel nice, they look nice, but guys, they're not working right. Um, the Generation 2, not so much. Much better luck. The Generation 3s seem to be the, uh, the ones with the problem. Gen 3, magazine. I got 28 rounds of Spear Gold Dot. 64 green. Seat the mag in gently, smoothly, slowly. Works flawlessly. Most every time it's going to go in. Okay. The problem is when you go fast. Okay, when you try to run it up in there fast. The uh, first round hits the bolt carrier group, the second round pops up. Um, sometimes it interferes, sometimes it doesn't. Um, it should never interfere and it shouldn't pop up ever. So let's see if we can get it to do it. There we go. I don't know about you, but that should never happen. Okay, go slow now, watch. Locks right in. Okay guys, that, there we go. Okay guys, that should never happen. Sorry. Hear it hitting? I cannot get that in there. 
Go slow. Lock right in. It is these cases that seem applicable for our familiar immediate action drills. Here, the issue of magazines having difficulty seating is a problem that is fixed by the slap and sports, the tap and tap rack bang, or the push pull of push pull rack. The actions of the newer streamlined immediate action drills that I just went over are exclusively dedicated to ensuring that the magazine is properly seating in the lower receiver of the rifle, aside from prescribing that, of course, a charging handle should be racked. Magpul has also had some reported issues with their over-insertion stops on some of their PMAGs and specific receiver compatibility. As an example, here's a video of a Magpul magazine falling out of a rifle. This issue could have been caused from a number of reasons, such as the over-insertion stop and lower receiver interface, the magazine round transposition problem, operator error, the ambi mag release accidentally being pressed, and so on. However, if the magazine had failed to feed around and not fallen out of the rifle, clearly immediate action such as tap rack or sports would have fixed the issue of the magazine having failed to lock into position correctly, in that they would ensure the mag catch engages the magazine. These factors all led to magazine insertion and seating issues that can cause a stoppage. As a special note, there's also the possibility of the magazine falling out. It was caused by, specifically, a problem unique to this specific polymer lower receiver, which I may cover in a video on a different topic. Here, I use Magpul as an example, not because I view it as a bad magazine, but specifically because of how well documented the issues are in the light that there are possible advantages to be gained in deviation from the military specification, but also very likely new problems waiting to be found in terms of design and compatibility. As you can see, Eva Prima Facie Simple changes to the mil-spec magazines in the hopes of reducing or fixing old problems can result in new and unexpected problems. A ninth consideration is carrier balance, where the rifle releases the hammer while the carrier is returning rearward, hence the term bounce, after having gone fully into battery. This obstructs the hammer from hitting the firing pin with its full force, and consequently, the rifle has a fully chambered round but does not fire. This is an issue in full auto rifles that do not have sufficient buffer weight to mitigate the carrier bounce and is largely a non-issue in correctly set up full auto AR-15s and essentially any semi-auto AR-15. This is more of a historical issue that is not currently encountered anymore on factory full auto rifles. But uh, for our purposes here, immediate actions such as sports and tap rack would work in clearing them. With those considerations out of the way, it seems then that most of the immediate action drills currently address only magazine and carrier balance related issues and not any other discrete feeding or extraction issue. In the other cases, they are not able to properly rectify a rifle stoppage and sometimes make the problem worse and also a further remedial action is required. Since carrier balance as an issue has been systemically solved, I will stop any further consideration of it. It is worth noting then that an application of immediate action in anything other than a magazine issue where the round is not able to be stripped from a magazine irrespective of the amount of force applied is generally a bad idea for a variety of reasons and that the people doing so are giving poor advice if the malfunction is known, like in Kyle's case. Further, to suggest that the use of the forward assist is categorically bad or even less useful in comparison to immediate action drills is also flawed in that the forward assist can actually be useful in a greater variety of circumstances, as we have seen here, than the use of immediate action is able to be. It also seems like the old and out-of-practice T-Sports drill 
more fully addresses a broader range of possible stoppages as a singular fixed procedure than the ones currently practiced because of the addition of a use of the forward assist as the first step in clearing a stoppage. For instance, T-Sports at least has the opportunity to also clear a broken case and a simple failure to feed while sports and tap rack do not. Sports and tap rack, for instance here, will also more likely cause a double feed while the forward assist would not have such a negative consequence. Considering the relative waning importance of focusing on magazine related issues and also the elimination of carrier bounce as a factor in mil spec guns, it follows that all the other issues will become relatively more important. This is because we have much better magazine design today than ever before, and so we have more means to us to reduce the occurrence of a magazine-related issue. Further, the forward assist then must necessarily have more relevance today as a way to clear an expected malfunction because of the fact that non-magazine-related stoppages must be occurring relatively more often than before, where the forward assist is also more applicable. Much of the common magazine problems can be mostly removed with good magazine selection and ensuring proper function of specific magazines with a specific rifle. This would mean that there are a number of steps that would make your rifle more reliable from magazine related issues. As a logical consequence in reducing magazine related issues, you would then be inherently reducing the relevance of applicability of all the immediate action drills to any future unknown rifle stoppages that you could expect. As an example, say your rifle should, by statistical probability, expect 10 stoppages out of 2,000 rounds fired with 6 from the magazine and 4 from everything else. Say the selection of good magazines of modern design halves the magazine-related stoppages, you would now expect 3 magazine stoppages plus the same 4 from the other types. This would mean that it would be more practical to focus on an immediate action drill or training with how to clear the other types of jams rather than an extant immediate action drill that currently only solves magazine related jams which now are only a minority of what you would expect in the future. Since the forward assist is more applicable to these other types of jams it is possible like in this case, that the forward assist would be able to clear more stoppages in this thought experiment than an immediate action drill. With these considerations, the forward assist then is more relevant as a device now to overcome the malfunctions we currently encounter than it has been with what has historically been observed for most of the AR-15 service life, which would to a degree also include other people's experience of the AR-15 as well. This also means that the greater a person's historical experience of the forward assist necessity or lack thereof, the greater the degree of the irrelevance of said experience if they are not accounting for the changing frequencies of AR-15 stoppages and the implications with immediate action drills. I do not say this to belittle anyone, only that experience and opinions on something like this must necessarily account for changes to the degree that the situation of the AR-15 changes at large. Another bonus consideration in the event of some stoppages is that if someone is avoiding the use of the forward assist, or rather more appropriately stated, unknowingly omitting its proper use, can lead to double feeds in some cases as I have demonstrated already. What I mean by this is that suppose a simple failure to feed occurs and that a person applies immediate action and then causes a double feed. Since the chance to use a forward assist is missed by that person who might have been inadequately experienced, trained, or improperly trained, or however else they come to choose the wrong reaction of trying to feed another round from the magazine, the resultant double feed could be falsely thought of as the original malfunction when it was unknowingly induced and not observed prior to the application of immediate action. 
this being possible, there must be some amount of people who, when considering the nature of the forward assist, they say they do not observe or have not observed a situation from their experience where it could have done good while actually and unknowingly missed observing such an opportunity. In this case, such a person would then miss an appropriate situation for the forward assist use and could later analyze such a situation as that the forward assist would not have been useful, entirely missing out on knowing that it actually would have been useful. As an example, consider Grantham's recent AR-15 mud test, where he induced four double feeds out of the six failures to feed that occurred, where the remaining two still had not stripped the round out of the magazine, and the bolts were not past the point where a double feed would be induced. In shooting the AK-105 clone that shares the exact same principles of feeding as the AR-15 does in this specific context, at the 20 minute mark, he does exactly as I had described earlier, where he induces a double feed from a simple failure to feed. Come on, get off. Okay. Okay, we had a failure to extract. Got that one out. Or, it looks like it did load, but just couldn't get all the way in. Oh, come on. There we go. Okay, so... At first, he misdiagnoses the malfunction as a failure to extract, and it was only after clearing the double feed that he had stopped to think about it again and reasoned that it could have been a failure to feed. And reasoning so, he then realizes the importance of ensuring the round is fully chambered and checks by pushing forward on the bolt carry and testing if the round was fully engaged by checking if it properly extracts. Later, he encounters another failure to feed and also decides to re-rack the charging handle, except this time the round had not left the magazine, and in doing so, he did not induce a double feed. This was perhaps out of luck or skill on his part. Either way, forcing the bolt closed, which is analogous to using the forward assist, would have given him more consistent and better results overall for his specific situation. To address experience again, Keep this point in mind when people talk of their experience of not observing a single time the forward assist could have done any good. A person could easily not have spent the time to further reflect on what had happened in the way that Garantham did. Also keep in mind the experience of others who may have had older style and worse magazines and how their thoughts on immediate action might not apply in the same degree and frequency as it would to someone who does have better magazines now. There's also a slight disparity of opportunity for the use of the forward assist between full auto and semi-auto rifles. In the stoppages that occur with the rifle at a battery, which may be unnoticed initially, the operator would then notice the issue when the trigger is pulled and the round doesn't fire. In semi-auto, the hammer would normally fall if the bolt carrier was forward past this point, and the rifle would then necessarily have to be re-racked. In full-auto rifles, set to auto, it would present itself merely as a dead trigger with a hammer being held by the auto seer, and there wouldn't necessarily be a need for the rifle to be fully re-racked if the malfunction could be cleared in some other way as the trigger seer can re-engage the hammer if the trigger is let go, preventing a fallen hammer out of battery. This means that the forward assist could be pressed with the rifle still out of battery and the rifle would be ready to fire afterwards since it doesn't have a dropped hammer like it would on semi-auto. It could be said then that this aspect of semi-auto further induces an additional minor failure of a dropped hammer in addition to the malfunction at hand. In the case of full auto rifles set to auto, the forward assist opportunity for use would be more apparent than someone exclusively using semi-automatic because of their differences in hammer sear engagement outcomes. 
So it could be said that the semi-auto rifles have more opportunity to further induce a problem of a dropped hammer to existing stoppages that then precludes the forward assist relevance in comparison to full auto rifles set to auto. This would necessarily mean that semi-auto rifles can have less opportunity to use the forward assist and thus slightly less relevance to having a forward assist in clearing malfunctions with all things considered. It would also mean that someone speaking about the lack of a need for a forward assist and only considering malfunctions in semi-auto would not be giving as relevant consideration to full auto rifles. For now though, it's worth considering the principles of immediate and remedial action and why people are so readily getting this wrong within the scope of the forward assist. Going back to Aaron Cowan's rifle malfunction video, which I featured in my previous video, his logic is largely sound apart from the technical analysis regarding the forward assist. Aaron here correctly states that tap rack and push pull rack are not the correct response, which implies that a standard immediate action will not fix the issue. He then moves on to observing the malfunction by feel and or sight, ultimately to use a specifically tailored approach to fix the issue, which is a remedial action. So in this circumstance, Aaron is demonstrating an appropriate dismissal of immediate action based on things that are observable or knowable within the context of timeliness where someone who has sufficient and correct knowledge of the rifle would be able to quickly or near immediately understand that immediate action may not be applicable because of their ability to quickly know the type of malfunction and its specific remedy. Also, at the same time, he rightly moves on to the consideration of the forward assist and only from ignorance recommends against it. The fact of whether or not he recommends it here is irrelevant to my point. The fact that it is brought up as a consideration in remedial action, however, is my point here. Aaron Cowan, whether he is conscious of it or not, here he considers the forward assist in this context as part of a remedial action because he rightly brings it to mind within the scope of his remedial action to fix this issue. The standard failure to feed shown here by Aaron Cowan is a near direct parallel to Kyle's circumstance which he was able to observe. Kyle, however, was not poisoned or deceived with the often repeated sophistry and falsehoods concerning the nature of the forward assist, that it is categorically bad, mostly bad, only works at some points of the rifle cycling movement, or that he should rather be more worried about whether or not the next cartridge he shoots will extract or not, or that Stoner didn't like it, so he shouldn't either, or that Air Force Security Forces had a better opinion of it than the Army Infantry did in the 1960s, so it shouldn't be on the rifle, or that maybe it could blow guns up in some fan fiction headcanon universe, or that some immeasurably small amount of gas might leak out if he like had been using a suppressor that somehow wasn't already leaking out of the ejection port and around the charging handle, or that his gun could seize up with it just merely sitting there, and so on. No, Kyle did not consider these negligently false arguments against the forward assist. He simply remembered that it was there to get the bolt into battery. In the few short months of gun ownership, if it could even be called that for Kyle, he had proven himself to be more capable of making the right decision in such a circumstance in the heat of a moment than even countless others commenting on the matter who have the benefit of hindsight, comfort, and all the time in the world to reflect on this situation, and they still get it wrong. Had he listened to any number of these so-called experts on the matter, he could have very easily received advice that could have got him killed. Does this sound hyperbolic to you? Well, here's just a sample of what paid professionals have to say about the Ford Assist. Infantry. And what I found with my experience with the Ford Assist is it doesn't really do anything uh, that you want it to do. In fact, it could cause more problems. So, the, for some reason, 
my bolt carrier group doesn't seat properly, I've got this handle on the back and I can just pull it back a little bit and let it go. And it's not gonna cause any issues with the rifle. To make my point more exact, there is a decent variation in extractor strength even among reputable brands as there is a variety of configurations for extractor springs, buffers, and o-rings. These all contribute to a variable margin of error in whether this technique can be successfully used. When Carl demonstrates his press checks in his newest video, see the description below, or when Aaron does it with his rifle, it will not work sometimes on some rifles from their demonstrations. I cover these variables in an upcoming video, so look forward to that. Also consider that this is with clean rifles in mind and not necessarily fouled ones. Since it is only partly reliable and relies on specific and precise technique, while the forward assist is fully reliable and is simpler to use, it stands to reason then that the forward assist is the more preferable of the options. Also consider which one was a better prescriptive technique for Kyle, who was under duress with a loaded gun pointing at his head. For not liking the forward assist is consider that if the bolt will not go forward, forcing it forward may cause additional malfunctions beyond what is keeping the bolt from going into battery. If there's a backed out primer or you had a shell case separation that's still lodged in the chamber, you can be making things much worse by beating against this uh, this this malfunction button, uh, which is pretty much what I would consider it. It's maybe not yours. I have never personally seen the forward assist remediate a malfunction on the gun ever. Ever. I have seen, however, many people, when something goes awry, to do something, and this could be training, I get it, mm -hmm. but the button's there, gun Push no the button. gun no worky, hit button. <laughs> and I have seen a number of situations in which hit button made things worse. Right. So if a, if a round was bent or screwed up or someone tried to chamber around earlier and it's kind of warped or there's filth or something that's causing it not necessarily to slug, uh, cycle sluggishly, but not go into battery, right? it's been my experience, you're better off clearing whatever that round is out of the system and chambering a fresh round. Right. Smash, smash just made this thing get wedge, wedge. It is, in part, thanks to these so-called experts among others, that there are AR-15 owners and users who happen to have much more exposure to the rifle, have more advice from the experts, and more training that actually think, to this day, that he could have simply performed a common immediate action drill even after having watched his defense video and his statement on TV. They and the so-called experts have all the time in the world to sit around and reflect on this subject when publicly commenting compared to the few seconds that Kyle had. And I'm sure they are sincere and take this seriously when doing so. Clint Smith, for instance, sits down with the AR-15 he's trying to sell and gives a sermon on how the scallop on the bolt carrier came about in direct descendancy on order from God, to Moses, to the Bible, to divinely inspire Eugene Stoner, and to give us this so-called feature we have on the rifle today. Next one, I see no sense in trying to pound something into the chamber that's not willing to go on its own. Hence, there's no forward assist. It's just that simple, all right? And then people go like, well, what happens if? Okay, great, we'll talk about what happens if, okay? So if you didn't get the word 50 years ago, if you get something where the bolt is not closed, okay, God and Stoner originally agreed that the idea of putting your finger or thumb in this dish in the bolt, which is why you don't want to buy some fancy custom bolt, just get a regular bolt with the dip in it. That dip actually is the forward assist and you heard it click. So the idea that I either dropped the gun, fell down with the gun, it's a battlefield pickup, and or I personally pulled it back, checked it, and then I didn't let it go forward smartly enough, I could stick my thumb in here and push forward, which I've done on many occasions. I'm if you notice, okay, I love watching all these people with these custom bolts with all the flutes and all that shit in there. If you check this rifle or you fell on the ground real hard, sometimes the bolt, because it's a cam type, will unlock. This little dish right here in the bolt, that was made 
from the beginning to push the bolt forward. Before this thing was put on the back to beat shit into the chamber that didn't want to go. Okay? I know that there's a little bit of this is sarcasm, but there's a little bit of it that's sarcasm on account of like, there's so many people that are so full of shit about this rifle. Okay, well, this is what I think. Dude. In his demonstrations oversight, he does this on an empty gun and does not demonstrate this using snap caps or real ammunition where the extractor has to slip over the rim, for instance. He only demonstrates the scallop in its best case scenario where the extractor would already rest over the rim of the cartridge and nearly zero force is required to chamber the round. He and all the others all, for whatever reason, choose not to take the minute or two to completely test their opinion on the matter and are seemingly unaware of the force required to simply close the bolt on a previously unchambered round from a failure to feed in a perfectly clean chamber or that re-racking the charging handle will cause a double feed in a simple failure to feed stoppage. Such advice about the scallop applies only to a minority of AR-15s in failure to feed from my sampling, and of course, the advice about re-racking would be made evident from a simple test. I am not being hyperbolic here. It really does take less than a minute to test this with an AR-15 and ammunition and or dummy rounds in hand. It seriously has not crossed their minds on the matter that they should do so before making such wrong and poorly applicable statements. Even specifically on the very aero precision bolt carrier groups that Clint is demonstrating with, it is not always possible for individuals to use their thumb on the bolt carrier to snap the extractor over the rim of a chambered cartridge. So Clint is giving bad advice even within the context of the specific AR he is trying to sell. Also, while we're on the note of trying to sell things, every single one of these so-called forward assist critics that I presented are either sponsored by or otherwise take money from manufacturers in selling rifles that do not feature a forward assist. Just an interesting coincidence I thought you might appreciate. Carl, too, doubles down on his criticism of the forward assist in the matter of press checks in consideration of a round that has already had the extractor slipped over the rim. In this video, he, for the most part, reiterates an argument he already made in the What Would Stoner Do Arrow Upper video that I featured from my last video, but it's strangely unlisted, but still accessible. What point does Carl have to do that? Why would the 2017 What Would Stoner Do up a receiver video uniquely detract from their project when Carl seems to have left all of the other 2017 What Would Stoner Do videos public, even when the old products are no longer used in the new version. Maybe it's because the older Arrow Precision part has an embarrassingly more aesthetic upper receiver than the company he shills for, KE Arms, is capable of sourcing. For whatever reason, it does not occur to him to address the more serious issue of the extractor not having slipped over the rim of a case in either video. Is it possible that he has not ever considered it? I'll leave that for you to decide. So, it's quite easy to see how misinformation or ignorance of the forward assist in Kyle's case could have further risked his life and perhaps even gotten him killed if he had listened to many of these people or experts of the opinion that the forward assist is a bad device. Don't simply take my word for it either. Test these things for yourselves on your own rifles. I will explain some of the specific considerations in this along with extractive variables and the chambering forces in an upcoming video. So much for immediate action. In the next video, I will address how the brand and model of Kyle's specific rifle has no way of knowingly applying to the reliability of his rifle's feeding. In doing so, I will address the poor arguments about how Kyle had a relatively higher need for it than someone with a quality rifle.